also start at the beginning of my slides and not at the end. <laughs> that helps. So, yeah. Can everyone see my slides? Yes. Yep. Great. Um, yes. So I tried it before in Zoom. Um, I could have um, yeah, changed them to PDF, but yeah, my, my PowerPoint just crashes in Zoom when I try to do the normal presentation mode. So I don't have videos or something. So I, I thought this view, if it's you know, big enough, is fine for everything, for everyone. And we will look at the timeline anyway. So the program for today um, it's a little bit a shorter version of of the agenda we we had for the um, in person meeting in Australia. So you might have seen the meeting agenda on the website in RDA and the meeting objectives and that we would like to talk first of all about an overview and outcome of the conference calls because we are considering to to build some working groups, but we want to do the interest group. Let me maybe... Can I... mute everyone? So I, I mute now everyone because there's some background noise. Okay. That should be now fine. You can unmute yourself then again. When, when you would like to talk. So we, I will give a short uh, overview on, on the VIEIG and um, then I give it over to Zimi to talk about the VIE for EIC. I will talk then about the Science Gateways uh, reference architecture we published. And what we are not um, really doing is a presentation of what, what is um, a proposed terms of reference, but more an open discussion and comments. So we don't have a panel of three experts, but I think that is fine for one hour time. One hour will go fast. So to have the chance to discuss your different models, I think is, is really priority here. So I go back to my slides. So, so what, what, the definition of really um, science gateway virtual search environments, virtual labs, is that we have this need for end-to-end -end solutions to access data, software, computing services, and equipment. And that is really tailored to the need for science and research and or for an engineering disciplines. And we have this increased complexity of research of hardware, software instruments, data volume, and data format. So if you have joined maybe meetings already before you know the slide, and the goal is really um, that virtual research environments, or however, whether we call them science gateways or virtual labs, make the researcher happy so that they can really do their science and their research and their teaching. And there are different, um, yeah, names for virtual research environments. So if you look at this elephant, so every perspective is a little bit different and you can find something like, in the US it's often a science gateway and in Europe the virtual research environment is a term that is often used. In Australia it's a virtual lab, but you can hear also about research portals or collaboratories or cyber infrastructure. And we always understand on the, the under these terms, we want to help and support researchers not to focus on the nitty gritty details of the underlying infrastructure, but really to support their science and research. So if we look at, so we had two calls uh, this year, it's January and February. I think it was our, it was our first um, try really to do something beyond the RDA meetings. So our participation was not so high yet, but I'm still positive. I think the more we, we advertise it and the more in advance we advertise and have an exact agenda, more people from the community will join. So, so the idea is really to keep the virtual research environment interest group as an RDA interest group. 
to have always these um, on-site sessions at RDA plenaries, but also not to go to a working group, which are normally existing for one and a half years and have to have one specific result. We would like to have different working groups about different topics in this area. And the discussions we had already um, on the first calls was that if you look towards a common reference architecture for virtual research environment, that we need something like building blocks and concepts. And if you look at my example, my colorful example with Lego, so yeah, the, these building blocks, they're, they're small. But if you put them in the right way together, you can have really fantastic architectures. And it's a plug and play. And the important thing is that it really plays together, that there is the interoperability, that there is really the possibility to put different um, yeah, tools, services, different architecture models together. And that was from my side, a short overview of what happened, uh, what we discussed um, in the community calls and uh, in the community call in February. So if I have missed out on something, um, Deeming, Keith, Christian, please uh, just jump in. Okay, so... Um, nothing, nothing to add, it's fine. So with this, I stop sharing because my next slide is um, about science gateways uh, towards the reference architecture, and I would give the word to Siemens. Hi. Uh, yes, let me share my screen. Just a moment. Yes. So. Can you all see my screen? I suppose, yes. 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 So I'm going to give you a um, quick introduction to a reference architecture, so-called EVIE, and then explain you what we did and how we actually tackle some of the, you know, the challenges, as Sandra just mentioned in her talk you know, a few minutes ago. And this is the results of a EU project called VIE4EIC. And this project um, already ended in 2019. And uh, it's coordinated by um, Keys, me, and you know, it's the participants from the you know uh, infrastructure, research infrastructure, you know, um, point of view. So that's right. This slide itself is taken from uh, the earlier uh, presentations made by Carlos, Cecilia, and Keys, and a couple of you know other colleagues. So one of the um, visionary problems we had in mind when the project started, that is, how can we enable scientists you know, to make use of the assets from different research infrastructures, which we can find nowadays in many you know, domains. And these are set up the research infrastructure from environmental science you know, in Europe. For instance, you know, from atmosphere domains and you know, marine domains, ecosystems and uh, solid earth. So the thing is, you know, if a scientist wants to, you know, uh, make experiments, solve certain problems, and uh, use assets from different research infrastructures, and um, how can we support them? What will be the kind of ideal uh, user-centered environment? Either you call this virtual lab, virtual v uh, VIEs or science gate, whatever, you know, and how that should look like. So we start from there, and then we start to break it down into, um, you know, more specific questions. And we highlight one of the key um, components in this context that is catalog. Basically, if we don't know what is the, uh, what are the resource, what are the assets infrastructure give us, basically, you know, we found it's going to be very difficult to build such VIEs. So we highlight, you know, the catalog, it's going to be a central component. And then we immediately run into a situation is, um, how can we interface, you know, the VIEs with these, you know, catalogs? Should we have a kind of centralized catalog at the level of the virtual research environment? Or should we let our virtual research environment talk individually uh, with in each research infrastructure and then talk to their catalogs? And this actually has been a kind of big you know, uh, um, problem for the project team you know, to, to tackle in the very early phase. 
um, we compared different uh, different possibilities, and of course, at the end, we chose um, the left. What you say, you know, from the screen at the left side, that option. We think, you know, um, to have a kind of centralized ones at the BIE level actually can make the alignment, make the integration a lot easier. And and before I, you know, explain the details, I would just say, you know, from that discussion, what you know leads the development team to. So from there, we start to classify, you know, the components, the possible components the VIE can offer into three different tiers. And the first tier, of course, you know, these all the tiers basically are the things, you know, sitting between the scientists, we call e-scientists, and the research infrastructure. At this, you know, at the moment we call, we only refer to the digital part of the research infrastructures. Then, you know, to make it different, we call the DRIs. Yeah. And those three tiers, namely, you know, application tier. This is a tier basically manages all the components, operate them, and provide kind of user interface, enable the scientists or the administrator you know, to customize the components and for their different you know, user communities. So that is the first tier. And that the middle part is the key, com key tiers, which we call interoperability tier. And that's the place we have to handle all the diversities and to handle all these you know, different uh, standards, catalogs and the metadata and all those settings. And to enable the application components, uh, first to discover what, what are the components, what are the assets exist and how to access them and how to put them together, integrate them. And, and then also at, we have to see you know, how to make all these things you know, machine readable, machine machine you know, interactable. So that's the interoperability in a tier. And more important, of course, you know, we have to solve all the things, how to interface the low level providers you know, who provide data content, software, in software tools, and software service. That's what we call this resource access tier. They are basically, we have to implement the functionalities that enable you know, the interaction with the, you know, the resource providers and with certain you know, service level agreement, resource management, software deployment, et cetera. Um, and then we, based on that, we identify six key components from the, you know, these three tiers. Namely, these components are, you know, the first, which you, if, if you see from the right side, that figure, and the uh, AI authentication authorization of account infrastructure. Basically, this is the kind of, you know, key layer enable the users access all the components or the content we provide from the VREs. And then you have system manager, linked data manager, workflow manager, basically, you know, to manage uh, software, um, software components, which are accessible by the user and the data content, which is generated by the user during their experiment. And then the uh, workflow manager is more for manage the activities, steps in a scientific experiment. Yeah, these are the uh, four components you saw from the upper side. And then in the middle, there is a central component we call this metadata manager. This is actually the really the core part of the interoperability team, which maps all the diverse metadata standards we observed from different catalogs. And by using the alignment you know, technologies between you know, the metadata ontologies, and we specifically use a tool which is built by one of our uh, project partners called a 3M, and that is a community-based you know, um, alignment uh, uh, platforms. So the users can build you know, alignments and are shared with the other users. And then if you're new to the certain problem domains, you can always search what are the existing alignments, and map them files and pick that and use it. So in the entire work, we choose um, a, a kind of, you know, uh, standardized metadata standards. We call, you know, it's, it's called Serif. Actually, you know, Keys is one of the you know, key person behind this standard. And we use that as the basis. We try to map all the different metadata we, we observed from these different catalogs, map them onto Serif so that we can um, just build a search tool, you know, align with the serif, then we can naturally uh, do the discovery across different catalogs. And at the low level, there is this interoperability manager. That interoperability manager basically you know, transfer, you know, these uh, um, mappings into the, you know, concrete operations and interact with the infrastructure, you know, catalogs and resource management. And 
soon after we get all these components and then we follow the macro surface based you know design methodology this is a kind of new trends in the software industry you know it basically the idea is you know to uh, take one step further than normal the classical service oriented architecture you break the you know the the design into more smaller you know unit so this unit can be you know much easier to scale out or scale up in a kind of virtualized infrastructure and we basically take one more step to break all the big building blocks you see in the previous slides into smaller ones and based on the smaller ones again we try to group them you know in a kind of customized way so that they can be directly take and deployed so these are the set of the um you know, uh, building blocks, which you can, you know, see from the screen. For instance, metadata service, which basically has a number of, you know, microservice components there. That's a graphical user interface. And then you have some, you know, a web server, you know, uh, uh, even workflow services and a resource manager and data, for, data model mapper, metadata manager. And then, you know, in the node service, basically you get another set of the microservices. Um, by following this, and then we also, you know, follow the kind of, you know, message, message bus based integration mechanisms and then plug all these different microservice based components, you know, through these, you know, message bus so that you can get a kind of operational uh, virtual research environment. Yeah. So that is more or less the methodology we followed you know, from the engineering point of view. And, and in a project, Basically, we, we, we developed, we didn't finish the implementation of all the building blocks, but we chose the most important ones and we made a prototype. And we demonstrate that in two, you know, um, important infrastructures. One is the EPOS infrastructure. And then the other one is the, um, the uh, basically a, a bigger set of the research infrastructure in, in the Envoy Plus project. So basically it shows how these building blocks, you know, you don't have to use all of them always at the same time. Time. You can pick a you know, subset of it and then use this in your own existing architecture to solve your problem. And this is the example we, we, we demonstrated how to choose the metadata manager and then how to choose the interoperability manager and these, you know, me, uh, again, metadata manager and workflow manager to show the user could use Taverna workflow, uh, workflow management systems through the EVIE, you know, the, the VIE environment and to the do the data discovery, software service discovery from different catalogs, and then put them into a workflow through Taverna, and I execute that. And the important thing is after you do everything, the workflow which is constructed by Taverna can store it back to the catalog of the um, EVI so that they can be reused and shared for future. Yeah, to summarize what I just explained, basically you know, what we learned from the VI for ES project that um, on a VI, we think, you know, um, in future, it should be an open architecture. It should really think, you know, um, using the kind of modernized designs. Um, what we learned from the microservices, it's actually, you know, it gives lots of flexibility for customization and also for the deployment, specifically when the environment, you know, the, uh, uh, is changed. For instance, from one cloud environment or from one e-infrastructure environment like EGI offers, you want to extend that to the public cloud using those kind of, you know, microservice architecture, specifically with the containerization, like the Docker, it actually make the, you know, the deployment very easy. Um, metadata centric design is very important. And we're going to face all these diverse, you know, catalogs, you know, for, I think for a long time in the scientific community. And the interoperability to me personally, I feel it's going to be unsolvable problems because you know whenever you scale out your system whenever you want to integrate new system in your you know environment you always have to tackle those kind of you know uh, interoperability issues you yeah. know so um, standards we recommend certain standards it's very important but in the meantime the system have to have certain you know um, strategy to handle these diversities like you know the mappings um, and new configuration, reconfigurability is also very important for the EVIs. In many cases, you know, the building blocks as the, you know, EVIE are, uh, layer is just a kind of, uh, um, let's say, abstractions. The specific user community could take the building blocks and then, you know, customize that based on their own specific purpose, based on their own uh, catalogs, based on their own user 
um, access policies, whatever, you know, they can build their own kind of, you know, operational environment. So actually, we also see these, you know, from some expectation of the EVIEs. For instance, in the LifeWorks project, um, you know, you, they already have some kind of distinguished between virtual research environment and virtual laboratories. You know, EPOS also, you know, already use some of the building blocks from these uh, um, EVIs to implement there are some specific features, for instance, like AI and for instance, like the workflow management. Every process is a project already finished. However, it's follow up and refer. It's just started the last year. And in this project, we're also going to, you know, look into uh, the VIE part and how to exploit this uh, architecture into, into this, you know, uh, and repair project to help the um, environmental research infrastructure have their VIEs, you know, operating in, in, the, in, the, in the end of the project. Yeah, that's the short uh, presentation I would like to give. Thanks. Thanks, Zime. Um, any questions for Zime? Uh, yes. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, you know that in different uh, research infrastructure, we have the different, um, uh, I would know, I would say, the, uh, how the data is stored and how the data is uh, accessed and what kind of data, for example, in the, uh, all the earth science, we have uh, 2D fields mostly. And in some other communities, you have different uh, structure of data. Uh, how do yes. you deal with uh, those ca different kind of structure? Yeah, this is a very good question. Basically, you know, the assumption is through the catalogs, basically the, all this information, including, for instance, about the data objects, the general information about who collects when and at which time duration, etc. plus the parameters, you know, what the data set is about, and it also with the information like where to access, you know, the data sets, how the, you know, the content is structured. Is this, you know, uh, in a NetCDF file or it is, you know, uh, in the database or other. So all this, we assume there is a sum. Of course, it's not yet ready. Because in the Embry Fair, we are exactly working on that. Yeah. So this, we think, it should be available as rich metadata information across a through the catalog. And if this is there, I think you know we can still assume the VIE by using this information, and then you know you 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 talk to the different eyes in a correct way, then retrieve the content you want. And there were some discussions in the Embry communities, for instance, you know, when, when you find the data objects and can we have a kind of, you know, like content negotiation as a function, you know, when you access the data, just talk to the provider. Um, you know, can you give me the data in this format and in this way or that way? Uh, we, we, we hope the actual infrastructure can basically deliver it, you know, as the format the user wants or the VIE wants. Okay. I have a other, another question, if uh, if I may. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe I missed it, but I'm not sure. Uh, do you have any provenance lineage uh, uh, module? You may, you may provenance what, or microservice? Yeah. Yeah, provenance and yeah. lineage. Yeah. So, so you have support for that? Maybe I missed it. Yes, the provenance. Yes, this is a. It's a component. It's not, it's not showing in this figure, but in our reference architecture in a document. If you go to our, you know, the website, the, mm -hmm. the project was finished, but all the deliverables, all the components, it's indeed it's a component. We explicitly modeled that. Okay. Um, we assume the provenance is, is going to um, take place at different levels. At the data level, of course, data management provenance is there, but at the workflow level, at the experiment level, the VI should also provide the provenance for that. So this is the also the kind of requirement we have when we design this architecture. Yes, it's a good point. Ximing, can I jump in there? Um, a key yes, point sure. of the choice of Serif as the catalog for VRE for EIC is that it has inbuilt provenance. So Serif has the concept of base entities like a project or a person or a data set or a web service. And it has the concept of linkages between them. Um, and the linkages between them have not only the role relating the two 
base objects being discussed, but also the temporal duration for which the assertion is valid. So it's an extended version of first order logic with temporal conditions. That means that by processing the link objects or link entities, you get automatically the provenance because you have a record of every interaction between every pair of base objects. Okay. Okay, thanks. Any further questions? Mm. Louis, was that a hand? But you, you are muted if you are talking. Louis, we are still muted. I have to unmute. Okay, yes. Uh, about the diagram at the microservices, um, yeah. what are precisely the microservices there? Yeah. Um, here, the microservices basically is the um, decomposition of the function which you see from these, you know, the early slides. But of course, you know, it's a model in decision, isn't it? From these six uh, big building blocks. And basically, what we did we um, decompose it into a smaller unit, uh, which we think it's a unit which can be, you know, um, relatively independent from the others, which can easily scale things out by just adding in instances. And that's the kind of, you know, uh, uh, way we, we get this set of microservices. All these in these smaller building blocks, these things, they are all yeah. microservices. And okay, the, the, they can be assembled, the, the, yeah. You know. Okay. Okay, I, I understand. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any further questions? So please um, remember, I have muted everyone in between. So if you are talking, we don't hear you at the moment. You are muted. <laughs> okay, great. So, Ziming, can you maybe stop sharing and yes. I share again? Yes, yes. Thank you. I, I, I'm going to this uh this is stop sharing yes thanks so i share now my screen to show slides ah. so how do, do you see my slides yes yes great so yeah, we looked also at reference models and frameworks um, with collaborators at the Science Gateways Community Institute, that is an NSF funded uh, institute in the US. And um, yeah, we provide services to help people to build science gateways and yeah, get users up to speed for science gateways um, of virtual research environment. Um, and we look, what are the successful models? And one is really to widely used complete frameworks, like you might have heard about the Galaxy framework, um, Hub Zero, the Open Science framework, the Global Data Portal, or that there are RESTful APIs and the support of multiple programming languages. So uh, Apache Avata, the Agave platform are um, examples for this, or uh, the Typist platform, platform. So they have already also then um, all these building blocks and you put them together in RESTful services and APIs. Or there are yeah, implementations out there like Cypress. Cypress is a widely used science gateway in the US with um, around 20,000 users now. And it has a really generic interface implementation so it could be reused also as a standard implementation um, some um, projects offer science gateways as a service. So users or developers can really use these implementations and have resources in the background. That is, for example, a project like SciGet. So the lessons we learned was the really successful approaches should be technology agnostic or use APIs or standard web technology or deliver the complete solution. That is what where really um, products, yeah, a different science gateway frameworks survived and were used most mostly. So, for example, the picture is from the Hub Zero instances, 
which I use worldwide, and it's really worldwide, as you can see. And community engagement is key. For example, the Galaxy Framework has a fantastic outreach in the biomedical community. Even so, it's a generic framework you can use for different um, domains. It's not bound by the technology to, to one domain, but the first uptake was in the biomedical community, and that is the, still the view, yeah, biggest community for, for Galaxy. So the paper we wrote, we looked at core capabilities. So I totally agree to the findings also Zeming showed. We looked at a little, little bit different um, perspective on, on a, a reference architecture and said, okay, but what are core capabilities? So a virtual research environment should recognize users. That, that is this, these are services for authentication, authorization. It has to integrate services. So this could be workflows, this could be metadata management, provenance, and organize user interactions into sessions. So that users have really these different sessions of, of doing a research project. Persistently store user interaction, that is important also for reusing um, steps and enabled sharing of interactions. And interaction in this way means not only an interaction with the science cafe, but data, tools, workflows. That, that would be the idle point really to be able to share everything that contributes to a research product. So the goal is to follow fair principles, to make tools, the software and data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable and really also address reproducibility. I think science gateways is one of the big um, areas where we can address this very well. Reproducibility is a big topic and if, if we can package workflows, tools, software in a way that it can be really rerun, reused, and also um, with the same data, with the same, we all know reproducibility has a lot of challenges and it comes to the nitty gritty details, like what kind of operating system is behind an infrastructure could already change whether a yeah, computational result is reproducible. So science gate based can help with this. The usability of computational methods that it's really addressing the needs of a community to, to have a user interface and to hide the details of, of the complex underlying infrastructure people don't know or don't need to know about and sustainability because if we have a reproducible and usable environment for researchers it will address also the sustainability of a solution the more users use a solution the better it's sustainable on the other side. So when we looked at it, and this is the paper that I cite also in the call and here on the slides. So what we really look at is, so we need these services, the integration of, of these services. We are addressing really the community, the collaboration, support contributions, and the community one hand on the one hand side, really the user community, not the ones who are developing virtual research environments and science gateways, but the ones who really want to use them and the providers and the developers. So that means that there are different communities and um, you also have to address, address them differently. So the infrastructure, we want to scale it. So one thing is to, to go to a distributed access maybe to the national infrastructures like Exceed or the EGI in Europe or RNET in, in Australia. But we have also infrastructure like lab instruments that are, could be connected or data collections. If we look at COVID-19 at the moment, for example, data collections is one important topic at the moment. So we want to bring that together that people can fast see the, the data in a really sorted, usable way. 
the integration is another at attribute that is important. This, yeah, the standard API with tools and it, the communities, the different users, they would like to have a workspace. So that is the normal way how human beings work with their research. So you, you want something that the data that is interesting for the user is accessible, that it's a domain centric user interface. So that is really tailored because to the community or to the user who's using it. So if we look, for example, yeah, at earth sciences, the user interface might look totally different than someone who's doing research about Shakespeare. So it, it's a different text mining. Uh, in the background, there might be similar technologies, but the user interface is then tailored to the needs of the community. So the, these are the, yeah, different or the five um, different attributes we, we looked at. And we think from there, we can go really to reference architectures, for example, like Deeming and Keith provided them, when it goes more into details, how to do that. So I think our, both the um, different aspects and the different perspectives we brought in well, on the one hand side via the Science Gateways Community Institute and on the other side via the VRE for EIC project, they are really complement each other. And I open the floor for discussions. I seem to have something like a chat. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I said that at the beginning. Uh, someone asked me to show it in the full screen. Um, my PowerPoint is crashing at the moment in the Zoom. Let me do nevertheless. I have also, um, in the program is also the, the um, URL to, to, the pre to the presentation and, and to the publication. can show that for a moment. So if you go to the meeting agenda, I added the slides and I will also add uh, Zeming and Keith slides here. So you can find, find, find the papers and the slides in the notes for the for the meeting. So do you have any questions about, about this reference yes. architecture? Yes. I have some, you know, uh, questions. I think it's very nice. As you said, it does complement the, the view we took in the VI for EIC project. Um, my question is in this, uh, in this picture, um, between the services and the integration, I saw the APIs, tools, and those things. So how these two, how do you normally separate these? Because I would assume service you're mentioning, specifically these electronic services, basically those are the component like web service. It's already have its own APIs. It has its own basically the um, uh, uh, representation or abstraction of certain tools, isn't it? Are these two, uh, what's the relation between integration and services? So that, uh, might not have made it very clear yet. So the services, we call the services, the basic services, we think every um, science gateway they need it on, on more on the authentication side on how to, to have the services like um, to, to make it working. Not the tools, not the workflows, not the APIs you integrate with external tools or with something with this functions you need really for the research. You need authentication and authorization, absolutely. You need the sessions, you need the data sharing to do your, re or you want them um, in a science gateway. But it's not the typical, the integration, what we mean there, uh, you could also put um, services there, but these are different services. So the basic yeah. services what running it's a virtual research environment that has these features of, um, for example, yeah. user groups. 
if you know what I mean, it's more this really. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, these are these services are not the service we're talking about. For instance, for building workflows, because sometimes the workflow is is also service flow. So these those services are belong to the integration part, and the yes. service on the upper part. These are the more like the operational service of the mm -hmm. VIE environment, the science gateway environment. Exactly the operational service. Okay. So this is, yeah, yeah. So we it's probably, good. but that is a good discussion because. Honestly, we, we had a hard time to give everything a, a term or a name where we were happy with. <laughs> like, that, that's that because, how we uh, yeah. the bill. So the yeah, terminology is sometimes really hard. Yeah, to I, I, I see a, I see an important needs actually for for, for, for for this interesting group. That is, if we could build some kind of you know uh, terminology like taxonomies or all these terms, it's going to help a lot these different communities. Because sometimes community from different, you know, VIE de de developments, you know, let's say the, the societies, they use different terms, but actually they refer to the same thing. Or the, yeah. or the same terms, but refer to different things. If we could make this, you know, through certain iterations, we make these, uh, you know, things defined, it will help a lot, I think. Uh, help everybody, you know, towards this common understanding of the um, beauty blocks, as we call it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I like that. As I said, we we are not clinging to the terms, um, and we had a hard time in between, really, to to say, okay, if we have these five areas, what is the right term to, to put there? We had also in between we thought that interoperability should be a big term as attribute of a science gateway or a virtual research environment. Yeah, interoperability. And we have it now kind of under workspace integration yeah yeah so if if we talk about for instance how this reference architecture to interface with the other types of reference architecture like a research infrastructure or data providers so the the connection should be through this infrastructure angle is that true um for instance if i have a you know if i'm a provider of data like in the every context, if I'm an I course, I you know I provide data, software components, and the simulation models, and I want to of course you know support VIEs. If I using your reference architecture, which which part should be the one you know those data providers look into? Integration or infrastructure? So data providers would be a mixture out of both. I I would say because. The infrastructure one is to say, oh, in the infrastructure we have, for example, a database with all these different data types, but the access to the database is integration. Mm -hmm. So, because which means the, the catalog, database, catalogs, yeah. Yeah, because the database, um, yeah, I, I love this discussion because it's really, <laughs> It was also tough for us um, because the infrastructure is there whether we use it or not. Let's say it like this. So a data provider has a database and 20 different science gateways could just use this database. Um, but maybe not only science gateways or virtual research environments, but you know, there's direct access possibilities. So to access it via a science gateway, we need the integration of access tools to get to the, to the infrastructure. And that's yeah. the same if you, for example, would say, oh, I have this lab instrument. The lab instrument itself is infrastructure to, to make really the access and to yeah, work with the data further. Yeah, yeah. You, you need the integration with a further tool. Good, clear, yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, I would have a gen general question, I would say. Um, if, um, for example, you know that in uh, several communities we have uh, the data is uh, separated in different files for some reason, because sometimes it's because of the file size uh meaning that the, the fact that the it's not a data centric view it's more like a file based view and um 
there are ways to hide this uh, artificial separation between the data files to the users so that the users see more like a database or data centric view. Is there uh, support for that uh, in the architecture? So yes, so that would be, for example, the workspace um, yeah. component. It's like a facet view. Yeah, it's like a facet yeah. view. Yes, so that would, would be the idea to say, yeah, the infrastructure provides, let's say, because the data is too large, or you know, or it's just scattered. It's distributed data. It's not all in the same place. Um, what sometimes happen, for example, also with lab instruments. So it's you know, at the one location and, and therefore, but you bring it together with data from another location. So for the user, they, they don't care. Um, they, they, they really would the like, point, yeah. they need those aspects of the data. They want to have it accessible in their workspace. And that would be really the definition of the workspace and how, how to show it to the user, how, how to really hide the details of the distribution and how to make it easier for them to really access it. I think that is the integration on the one hand side with the tool, accessing the infrastructure, but in a workspace that it doesn't matter to the user, whether it's, you know, whether it's, an, it's one part of the data lays in France and the other part of the data lay, lays in Chicago. Is they need both. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the data. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. There's, there's a really interesting associated uh, question or, or, or aspect we need to consider, which is data locality, because yeah. quite often the data has the famous five V's, um, and that means you really can't move it. So you have to somehow execute a service at a research infrastructure of some kind to get just that part of the data that's required for the user purpose. Uh, and this becomes quite interesting. Yes. I mean, I think we are, you know, already working for years on when, you know, how it's easier to move really the services and the access tools and the, um, to the data instead of moving the data because the data gets bigger and bigger. So I, I think these discussions are still big ones and still not always solved for all the problems. I'm totally... Yeah. Yeah. It's the same for uh, scheduling, meaning that if you have the same data, uh, uh, part of the data that is available at several locations, then uh, which one do you choose? <laughs> Schedule, <laughs> scheduling. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, therefore, we, we still do a lot of research and scheduling. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and scheduling across both uh, replicates and partitions, which can happen, uh, is also interesting. Uh, and there was quite yeah. a lot of work done on a European project called Melodic on exactly that, which is quite, quite fun. It has a kind of a intelligent middleware um, which takes the user application as a black box. It takes a description of the application in a language called Camel, and then it optimizes dynamic redeployment across multi-clouds. So, yeah. so quite interesting and very complicated. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. I, I think one of the future directions for the BIEs, um, it should basically and make use of these kind of scheduling strategy or intelligence formulated as a certain language, be part of, make it as part of the workflow management. Because, you know, this to me is a, it's a kind of, pro, it's a programmability issue of the, let's say, the data infrastructure or, you know, uh, virtualized infrastructure, whatever you call. It should be part of the workflow execution lifecycle. And there, I think, you know, we should really pay attention to what is latest progress in the, in the cloud community. There are lots of work actually is happening there, specifically from the cyber infrastructure, you know, virtual infrastructure, how to program all these, you know, um, different, you know, network, uh, network layer of these different entities, make it optimized for specific application requirements. And I think that this, we should get this as part of the, you know, VIE component. 
and it's not going to be a single answer uh, to say we should send the data to you know uh, to the processing or send processing to the you know to the data. It's going to be a, you know a customized solution for different problems. Yes. So yet um, after yeah we had some nice discussions now and we have seen the two presentations. So. So to move forward, maybe with the idea to have a working group on a specific topic. Um, one could be, and we thought about that, to work with on terminology to, to use between the different uh, user communities to have maybe really, yeah, something like a resource where people can look at terminology and look it up. Would that be something interesting, interesting for the people here on the call? Or would you be interested to, to join another, let's say, one or two calls before the next uh, RDA plenary to discuss these topics? That's something that would you like to see? So do you, do you talk about uh, semantics and met, uh, metadata mapping between different, different uh, communities or not? So we, we could talk about metadata mapping, for example. Um, I, I mean, that it's a little bit different than terminologies, but metadata is definitely what comes up always also for, for defining um, what is a virtual research environment, what kind of data is in a virtual research environment, what kind of services is in there. So that could be one perspective, yeah. And, yeah, but, but yeah. for that part of the metadata mappings, there are lots of working groups, I understood, you know, it mm -hmm. already exists. I think we could yeah. focus a little bit more just about terminology for describing a virtual research environment and the relevant concepts. Make sure that different communities worldwide, they can, we can share this common um, set of the vocabulary to describe our architecture, our services, our, you know, just okay. like what yeah, the usual and that. in the VIE yeah. for years. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, so to answer to answer your question, uh, yes, I would be interested uh, to to participate in that because I think it's very important. We have seen already today that we need that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Therefore, I really like when we discussed, um, yeah, this plenary, and we looked at our you know publications or our approaches, and we realized how how complementary they are, but also, how different, <laughs> you know, like, oh, okay, so you call this, this, okay, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, any further opinions? So, what I would like to ask, because I have to admit, I, I try to catch up with taking notes after the fact, which is sometimes hard. But if people who are on the call maybe could add their names in, under the session, that would be fantastic. And the next time I should ask at the beginning. <laughs> I know, um, that would be great. And so maybe add also your email address if, if um, we can contact you directly. That would be nice, maybe for a talk for where? Or to an idea, yeah. But do people know where to put their names? Maybe you can put a link in the chat box. Oh, sorry, I sent it. Oh. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, I, I sent it to the chat, but not to everyone. Let me. That is a typical thing. If I get a private chat, it, it doesn't switch back to everyone automatically. <laughs> So, do you see the chat? Did everyone get the chat URL? Yes. Okay. Great. Yes. So, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining. Um, if there's a further topic you are really interested in, we still have a couple of minutes. So, just, just shoot your ideas. For me, it's just a, a, a question on how the um, the uptake was 
was it easy to have uptake by the developers of the uh, specific research infrastructure to to uh, to take this uh, those idea architecture idea and to use them was it a large effort uh, to do that so um for, for the reference architecture I showed, it was more after the fact that we we, we looked at existing systems mm -hmm. uh, and then made the definition. I know that shouldn't be, <laughs> but that was <laughs> more the idea of oh, these are the solutions we are working with or we are developing or providing. So I, I think for keys and theming, it was the right way around. But uh, maybe I let them answer. <laughs> who has taken up the, yeah, the reference architecture. Because sometimes the different research infrastructure have their own way of developing their, their own yes. uh, services so, already. How, 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 uh, how did you manage that? I, I, as this actually goes um, to a kind of typical discussion we had with the research infrastructure community. So if you have an architecture, you want to push that from top down, usually it's difficult. And, and there is another way. If we could use the uh, reference architecture as a standard terminology to annotate the components we observed from, you know, these different communities, and by aligning those different components using our, you know, reference architecture terminology, people actually can better see each other's contribution. Maybe they can, it will help them make use of each other's component. One of the discussion we had in one, in an earlier uh, small discussion with Sandra Keys, that is, through the Science Gateway catalog, actually they already collect a big set of the um, building blocks or successful you know, Science Gateway uh, deployments. If you know, community could join the effort, annotate those you know, deployments with, by using the terminology we can work out, actually I think that it's already a very nice place for people to pick the correct things to, to, to apply that and instead of reinvent everything by themselves. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm aware of the time. And um, yeah, we are also happy about feedback if you think we should have made this also a one and a half hours, but I thought, or we thought like one hour might be for all the virtual meetings we have at the moment the right time. <laughs> and not trying to make it exactly the same as if we would be in person at the plenary. Um, any feedback? Happy to get that, and I wish you all to, yeah, stay healthy and safe, and hopefully see you at one of the next meetings. Okay, thank well, you Sandra, very much. Sandra, you will yeah. send out a, a, a information when the next meeting is happening. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and uh, is the plan that you and the other co-chairs will now establish a kind of working group to look at the idea of a reference model? That was a little bit the idea now to say we give it another try. We have between the plenary meetings yeah. one to um, online. The, the point is it's, it's quite a long process to establish a working group with RDA. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> yes. if, we, if, if you're thinking we might have a working group meeting at the next plenary in the autumn, then we really need to start now in establishing that working group yes <laughs> we need to start. so so i leave that to you and zimming but if you need my help contact me <laughs> sorry i'm kieran of course but uh yeah <laughs> if you need my help just contact me absolutely thank you very much and thanks kids for pointing this out yes move on bye -bye. okay bye thank you very much thank you have a nice day bye bye Bye.